and welcome back to OOF, Right in the Childhood. I'm Jen, and each week I talk about both the history and social commentary of one of the Disney animated feature films. This week I'll be talking about the Three Caballeros from 1945. For once, a 1940s cartoon has a lot less racism, but it trades it off with adding more creepy men. The day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, 800 soldiers arrived at Walt Disney Productions and occupied it for almost a year. Soon thereafter, Walt Disney began creating training and propaganda cartoons for the government. This is the only full-length theatrical release of that time. If you want to hear about other, shorter cartoons and a more thorough history of the World War II propaganda, I'll tell you how later. Anyway, as the United States joined World War II, there was a growing concern that Central and South America would be vulnerable to Nazi propaganda. They knew that some South American countries had close ties to Germany, And as the war dragged on, that concern became more and more paranoia. The fear was that, if Germany were to create treaties with Mexico or the Central American countries to its south, they would be able to place missiles in range of the United States or take control of the Panama Canal. The U.S. government had an idea for a secret weapon, Mickey Mouse. The Latinx community adored the Disney cast of characters, So, they approached Walt Disney to ask if his studio would be a cultural ambassador to encourage friendship and cooperation with Latinx countries. Walt flew with his wife Lillian and 20 members of staff, including artists and composers, to Mexico and several Central and South American countries. Along the way, artists sketched the sites and people while the composers listened to the music. They returned to the U.S. and the studio produced two different movies— Saludos Amigos, and The Three Caballeros. Both were released in theaters. There weren't home movies at the time, after all. But when I started this project, I decided I was limiting my commentary to movies that clocked in at over an hour. So, here we are with The Three Caballeros. The result was a collection of six separate cartoons with Donald Duck visiting his cousins in Latin America with a series of storylines that explored the countries with a cast of characters among which were live-action humans appearing on the same screen with cartoon characters for the first time. Aurora Miranda, the baby sister of Carmen Miranda, appeared as one of the dancers as the characters visited Brazil. They also hired a dance troupe from Los Angeles called the Padua Hills Players to perform Mexican sections of the film. The Padua Hill Players were actually a really interesting entity in and of themselves, Started in 1931, it was a nonprofit group dedicated to building understanding and appreciation of the Mexican culture for white Americans. They both learned and taught cultural dances and really did a lot to encourage intercultural understanding. The Three Caballeros is probably the first truly experimental film Disney embarked on. If you don't count Snow White as an experiment in feature-length animation, it gave us animation techniques that led to classics like Mary Poppins and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I know, that's not Disney. That's not the point. I dug around the internet trying to find the final budget of this film, but there doesn't seem to be any truly documented number. I did find one person on a forum claiming that it only cost the studio $150,000, which is a little hard to believe, given the other movie's budgets and that this film included flights to multiple countries and live-action actors, but it's the only figure I could find. What is easy to find is the box office revenue. When The Three Caballeros was released, it raked in $3.6 million. That's $51.8 million today when adjusted for inflation. It was also nominated for Best Musical Score and Best Sound Recording for the 1946 Oscars. But it didn't win. This podcast is sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. I love creating content for you, and becoming a patron on my Patreon helps me cover hosting fees and upgrade the equipment I use while allowing me to minimize ad time. At the $5 level, you not only get an ad-free version of each episode a day earlier than it's released, but starting next month, you get a special bonus episode on the first of each month with content available exclusively on Patreon. In October, I investigate the role of Walt Disney Productions during World War II, from the occupation of the studio by the U.S. military to the hundreds of hours of training and propaganda that the studio released. I also provide synopses and commentary for the cartoon portions of eight of the propaganda pieces they released during the war. Information for my Patreon can be found on my website at oofmychildhood.com.
description on my streaming service reads, may contain outdated cultural representations in very small texts. Excellent. The titles are really colorful and portray the traditional art styles of Latinx countries. They sing about being the three caballeros, and I just realized I don't know what that means. Google Translate says it means gentlemen. Wikipedia says it's specifically about night gentlemen. This is going to be proved wrong later. We open to a box with a tag on it. It has about 100 stamps on it and really pretty bows. It's in Spanish, but even my I stopped taking Spanish in third grade brain can read most of it. I'm going to mispronounce it, though. Felicitones al Pato Donald en su, en su cumpleaños viernes 13 de su amigo en Latino America. Yeah, I know that's not how you say 13 in Spanish, but my brain just stopped. Congratulations to Pato Donald on his birthday Friday 13 from his friends in Latin America. Oh, hey, wait, is Donald's birthday Friday the 13th? Put that in your trivia hat, everyone. Wait, no one's birthday is Friday the 13th. Well, that's fun. Let's do some investigation. In 1945, there were two Friday the 13th, April 13th and July 13th. This movie was released in September, so flip a coin. And Google Translate says Pato means duck. Okay. Oh, then the movie translated it for me. That was wasted time. Oh, well. Donald's super excited about this gift. He tears it open, and then inside the big box, there are three smaller boxes, because that's how people received presents, I guess. The first gift is a projector and a screen, which is a pretty impressive gift for the 40s. Donald has some really rich friends in Latin America. Aves rajas. That means strange birds, the narrator says. I mean, I don't speak Spanish, but given what I know about Latin roots, I believe it means rare birds. You have more cousins here than there are coffee beans in Brazil. Okay. Why did they send us to the South Pole? That's not South America. But penguins playing in the snow are cute. Pablo the penguin lives in an igloo with a stove and is a better representation than almost any other depiction of those who actually do live in igloos. This penguin is me and my feelings on cold. I love him. He tries to ski away with a stove on his back. That goes as well as you might expect. Maybe he'll be content to stay at home this time. Well, that's a short cartoon. Now he's constructed clothing from hot water bottles. I might try that. Pablo cuts his igloo off the ice floe and sails off with his stove. There's a line in here about him being near Cape Horn that I feel might be a joke, but I have no idea what that joke was. Most of the rest of the short is just him navigating around South America. Yep, I was waiting for that ice boat to melt. But don't worry, his tub floats. Somehow. I mean, I don't think fiberglass tubs float now, and I think tubs were made of steel in the 40s. Nonetheless, he gets to the Galapagos and builds himself a hut. But now he misses the cold. Fake news. We'll head to the Amazon, and we're talking about the birds of the Amazon. They're all cousins. They talk about these cool, real birds and then move to the Araquan. That's not a real bird. You know how I know? Because I checked. He sings a song that is both annoying and catchy. We'll go on to real birds again. Flamingos are pink. We've moved into a story from Ecuador, which is interspersed with Spanish. It does give us some good vocabulary for clothing. This kid is hunting wild ostrich? What? That's not a thing? Okay. Oh, today he's hunting condors. But he normally hunts ostrich? What ostrich? That is a donkey with wings. It's a smart little donkey, too. The donkey both sings and he haws. Honestly, this segment about the flying Ecuadorian donkey has way more culture than anything else than Disney had produced at this point. It talks about yerba mate and fiestas and bocce. He's decided to race his flying donkey. This can't possibly go wrong. And shock of shocks, you'll get disqualified for racing with a flying donkey. The narrator says neither him nor me was ever seen again as long as we lived, but he recorded the voiceover for the story how. Oh, it's a new package, and it dances. There is a dancing bird that speaks Spanish. Joe Caracoa, I've never heard of you, but you're being interrupted by the Araquan. Have you ever been to Bahia? Nope, it's in Brazil. Maybe he speaks Portuguese now that I think about it. 
we proceed to a very pretty song about Bahia, which, according to Wikipedia, is a state in Brazil. There's nothing really special about the song, but the art is absolutely amazing. It makes me want to visit Brazil. Joe tells us about all the things Bahia has, and I couldn't tell what a single one is. Okay, so these birds are singing about how great Bahia is, and then Donald's like, well, have you been? And they're like, no, actually, good point. Let's go on vibrantly colored trains. And Bahia is inside a pop-up book somehow. And we have real people all of a sudden. This is Aurora, Carmen Miranda's little sister. She carries a tray of baked goods on her head instead of a bushel of fruit, and they're singing, I'm going to guess in Portuguese. Google Translate helpfully tells me that Os Quindins de Yaya means the Quindins of Yaya in Portuguese. That's not helpful. When they introduced Aurora, they said she was Yaya, so I'm going to guess they're her Quindins. Whatever a Quindin is. Back to the internet. Wikipedia tells me a Quindim is a popular Brazilian baked dessert that is typically yellow and contains sugar, egg yolk, and ground coconut. And now I want that. Now I'm on to Googling and their little Brazilian custards. Adorable. I will mention that at the time of this film's release, there was really no way for the audience to find out what this was. So, I mean, they were just giving them a ton of information that they couldn't figure out. Donald's tired, but he shouldn't sleep because there are more presents. Instead of sleep, Lud stands in front of a sound wave slash acid trip that's a combination of Fantasia and Pink Elephants on Parade. In this sequence, the sound waves shows us the instrument making the sound. That's fun. The lyrics are in Spanish, so I'm sure they're saying something great. I have never heard this bird's name, but according to IMDb, we've now introduced Pachito Pistoles, and we're at the Three Caballeros portion of the movie. It also seems that we've moved to Mexico. There is a silhouette of a pretty lady and a fox whistle at it. That's how I like my cartoon birds, attracted to human females. Oof, right in the childhood. Now, we're going to learn about Christmas in Mexico. Las Posadas is a tradition in Mexico where children seek shelter for the nativity. And when they find some, they celebrate with a piñata. Now I'm wondering if this is the first many white Americans ever heard of a piñata. The art here is very traditional Mexican and it's made of stills rather than animation. It's beautiful. Donald proceeds to try to hit a piñata like every child ever. And we move on to the history of the Mexican flag. I didn't know that Mexico City was built on a lake. That's incredibly cool. I watched this movie shortly before I learned about the axolotl and its habitat that's threatened because they only live in that lake and Mexico City keeps growing. Save the axolotl. It's a cool little amphibian. Back to some traditionally drawn stills over a love song for Mexico City. I'd feel better about these if I thought for one second that a Mexican artist drew them. The birds are now flying through Mexico on a magic serape. Back to live action with cartoons overlaid. Here they show some really interesting landscapes, and then we return to dancing. Herein are the Padua Hills players that I mentioned earlier. They're kiddos dance. Um... Donald's given all kinds of looks to the human women, and I don't know how I feel about that. He grits them with, Hi, toots. Ugh. He dances with them, and then they fly off after calling them beautiful. I guess there are worse things? But Donald fights them taking him away from the women. Ew. They go to Acapulco Beach, and Donald sees women in bathing suits and says, Boy, am I gonna like this place, and calls them hot stuff. They proceed to dive bomb the beach because in the 1940s, women in swimsuits was a good reason to bring war upon a beach or something. Donald then proceeds to be straight up creepy with this beach of women. I do love these swimsuits, though. The girls, however, are used to men being the worst, and they throw him into the air. He screams at them, Hey there, you can't do this to me, as if women have no choice but to be in love with the anthropomorphic duck. Gee, I wonder where men get the idea that they're owed sexual attention by women. Oof, right in the childhood. We're now in an acid dream of sorts with Donald chasing women around. Boy, Disney animators sure like to make these things. The singer is the center of a flower, and she's interrupted by very loud singing and screaming. I don't even know why any of this is happening. Those are birds with human legs. Female human legs. The cactus are dancing now. 
The best part about the woman dancing in the sombrero is that she does not seem to give two craps about Donald. She just keeps dancing, and her cacti attack him. Anthropomorphic dancing cactus ducks. Didn't see that coming. How did we transition from dancing cacti to, um, fake bullfighting ballet? Is that what this is? Set fireworks off on the costume your friend is wearing, kids. It'll be great. That is the strangest set of anything I have ever watched. And this is what we did to encourage friendship with the Central and Southern American cultures? This is so weird. Before you ask, next week is not going to be a rewatch of The Song of the South. There are a few reasons for this. First, it was initially based only on titles that were on Disney+, Plus, not sponsored. As Song of the South has never been released for private viewing in North America, it's not there. Second, it's hella racist. I have watched it. Years ago, when the Disney Channel used to show it on TV. Even as a child, I knew it felt wrong. And you know what? I'm willing to have a discussion about how certain racist slurs are no longer acceptable. And as we'll see going forward, I'm happy to talk about individual scenes that are problematic. But the whole friggin' movie is just a mass of racist caricatures. I would spend the whole time going, nope, that's racist. And it just doesn't seem like a great time for anyone. Despite that, I do have something in store for you listeners. On Thursday, I'll be back with a special guest of Rob Kaiju of Kaiju FM. Rob really loved the Three Caballeros as a kid, so he and I are going to talk about his memories of the film and his impressions of it today. If you're already subscribed to the podcast, you'll get a notification when the episode goes live. If not, what are you waiting for? Hit that button. And in the meantime, let me know your impressions of the Three Caballeros. Did you watch it as a child, or is this episode the first you've ever heard of it? Tell me your memories and current feelings toward the film on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching the show's name or the handle Oof My Childhood. This episode's cover art was created by Ventrice Francesco. I link to his Facebook and Instagram in the show notes, my website, and on social media. My theme music was composed and played by Sean Rudolph of Let Music Be. For more information on that studio, you can visit their website at letmusic.be or visit my website for an easy link. You can find transcripts for each episode on my website, and if you check my YouTube channel, I have captioned video versions of each episode as they're published. I do my best to provide YouTube videos and transcripts at the same time the episode is released, but if this one isn't up yet, you can always check on my website for an update and a link to the appropriate video. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you come back each week to discuss Disney Through Modern Eyes. And while you're at it, if you're enjoying yourself, please let your friends know about me. I'd also appreciate a rating and review wherever you're listening to the show. This podcast is written and recorded by me. This episode was edited by Anastasia Saff. I release a new episode every Monday through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many other podcatchers. So until next time, keep the magic alive.